Billy Collier coming up. SAPD answering questions about possible exposure to the public after one of its officers tests positive for COVID-19. A lower count means lower representation and less funding. Why it's more important than ever to fill out your census form. As the death toll from COVID-19 continues to climb across the U.S., leaders all over the country are trying different things to stop the spread. We're going to take a look at the different approaches. We've been told to clean and disinfect the surfaces in our home, but coming up, the danger of mixing certain household products. And comfortable days like today are numbered this time of year. We all know that. The humidity is going to return soon. Also, rain chances are going to spike. I'll see you in a few minutes to talk about it. And because of the stimulus bill, some of you will be getting a check in the mail. But beware, scammers are looking for ways to take that money from you. The News at 5 starts right now. One thing that is clear, and that is distancing practices that you all are doing, they're working. But now is not the time to let up. First at five, Governor Greg Abbott backing President Donald Trump's recent decision to extend social distancing guidelines through April 30th. That means dining in at bars and restaurants, going to the gym and any other than essential travel is banned. Today, the governor also ordered all Texas schools to remain closed through May 4th, saying these measures are in place to further prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to maximize the amount of lives saved. As of today, 41 Texans have died from COVID-19 and the complications that it inflicts. The governor said more than 3,200 people have tested positive. That's out of close to 43,000 people who met the guidelines for testing. And today we learned 28 spring breakers from Austin have all tested positive. Here at home, the San Antonio Police Department is working alongside Metro Health, trying to figure out how much interaction an officer who tested positive for COVID-19 had with the public and his fellow officers. As our Dylan Collier reports, that officer continued to work for several days before beginning to feel sick. The sign tells San Antonio residents to call a phone number instead of walking inside the downtown central substation. The police department's attempt at minimizing the number of face-to-face -face interactions its officers have with the public. Monday brought confirmation from the department that one of its officers, a seven-year veteran, is now recovering at home after contracting the coronavirus. The first officially recognized case within SAPD's rank and file. SAPD officials acknowledge that the officer worked for more than four days after coming into contact with a family member who may have the virus, raising questions about whether other SAPD officers were exposed or if the general public was exposed. A department spokeswoman shared with us an email sent to another San Antonio media outlet that called their reporting on the officer factually deficient. The email states it's not yet known how many people the officer came into contact with after his possible exposure through traffic stops and other interactions with the public. SAPD says contrary to the other outlets report, the officer did not travel to New York City, the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. And finally, that after the officer told a supervisor he did not feel well, he was advised to seek medical attention and not return to work. SAPD officials today declined several requests from us to be interviewed for this story. A spokeswoman did confirm that 16 SAPD personnel, 12 sworn officers and four civilians are currently in quarantine, although it appears only two of those officers are in connection to this infected officer. Reporting live outside the central substation, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. All right, Dylan, so it's possible that officer came into contact with people after he'd already been exposed. What steps have we taken to find out exactly how many people that could be? Well, Steve, through sources, we have a general idea of when this officer was exposed to his family member and when he last worked. So using those parameters, we requested a copy of all citations written by this officer and all traffic warnings written by this officer. Once we get those records back from the city, which will probably be in a few weeks, we'll have at least a baseline idea of what sort of work this officer was doing in the days when he was possibly already exposed to this virus. Dylan Collier live. Thank you, Dylan. 
The U.S. has seen more than 177,000 cases of COVID-19. At last check, just over 6,000 people had recovered. But another 3,600 have died. And public health officials are warning that this is actually only the beginning. Each state facing different peaks at different times, underscoring the challenges of the uniform national response. Nadia Romero has the latest now from Washington. Nadia? Well, Ursula, right now the White House Coronavirus Task Force is holding its daily briefing and they're talking to us about what we are seeing all across the country. So what we saw previously was just happening in coastal states, New York, Washington, California, now spreading to the Midwest and Deep South. The president says that FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers will hold uh, makeshift hospitals, military style hospitals in Michigan and Louisiana. But we all know that we've yet to reach the peak with more cases to come. Still days from a forecasted peak in New York State. We're all in search of the apex and the other side of the mountain. A field hospital in Manhattan's Central Park and the USNS Comfort getting ready to help New York City's overtax hospitals. More cities preparing for their turn as hotspots like New Orleans. We're preparing for a significant amount of hospitalizations and unfortunately is a, a corresponding significant amount of deaths. Detroit and Chicago are filling their massive downtown convention centers with hospital beds. Los Angeles, watching cases rise, is also looking to what's been successful elsewhere. I think we're learning from, from everyone who's um, you know, taking part in really mounting what I think are, are appropriate and sometimes heroic efforts to slow the spread. Like New York's cooperation with neighboring states, other regions are coordinating stay-at-home orders like Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. We reached the point where we believe it's necessary to uh, further uh, get people uh, off the streets so we can continue to save thousands of lives. The nation's top public health experts waiting for the measures to have a mitigating impact. I believe it will happen that we may start seeing a turnaround, but we haven't seen it yet. And right now we are hearing more from Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks who are talking about social distancing, saying that it is working, seeing the effects in California, maybe seeing the flattening of the curve there. But in other parts of the country, uh, those cases are just starting to rise. But we do know that some people cannot follow these stay at home orders. And that's why we're seeing sick outs or walkouts at facilities all across the country like Amazon and Whole Foods, those workers asking for hazard pay. Live in Washington, D.C., I'm Nadia Romero. Stephen Ursula, back to you. Thank you, Nadia. Be sure to stay safe. Tomorrow, April 1st, is Census Day. It's not the deadline. Instead, it's meant to be the day for you to start counting the number of people living in your home. Yet now the nation's census, which happens every 10 years, has the COVID-19 crisis to contend with. Our Jesse DeGriado says that's why taking the needed count is even more crucial now. I'm a little biased when it comes to San Antonio. Yes, I am. A 1990 MacArthur High School grad, the Census Bureau's chief spokesperson, says he knows how much San Antonio has grown over the past decade, especially so now with COVID-19 as a backdrop. Yet with so many people staying home to avoid the risk. While you have the time and when given the opportunity, we ask that you respond to the 2020 Census by going to 2020census.gov. Going online, one of three options, as well as by phone or by mail. It's never been easier to respond, but it's more important now more than ever to self-respond. He says it's safer for census takers and the public by not knocking on doors. He says a lower count not only equals less political representation, but also less federal funding for needed programs like Medicaid, Medicare, and health care in the next 10 years. And with the crisis far from over, that would not be good, he says. We can't do this by ourselves. The census is yours. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. While many of us are taking unprecedented precautions to protect ourselves from COVID-19, the FBI is reminding the public that criminal threats still exist and you're a target. In fact, scammers are already at work using the pandemic as a way to steal your money or valuable information. The FBI says one way criminals are taking advantage of a desperate situation is through malware. They want you to click on to receive 
critical information about COVID-19 or some communication that relates to the pandemic that we're facing. The FBI says the fake links could actually be software viruses. Coming up on the News at 6, Devin Clark's going to introduce you to a senior couple who reported scams to the federal government and shows us how they've been dodging them ever since. Northeast ISD doing good in the community this morning. As the days go by, the supply of personal protective equipment at doctor's offices and hospitals across the city is shrinking. With students out of the classroom, any ISD decided to make use of its own stockpile today. The district donated hundreds of medical supplies to UT Health San Antonio to be distributed where they're needed most. These items are extremely important for healthcare providers in the hospital. Um, this is what is going to prevent the transmission of, of COVID-19. Any transmission we can prevent to our healthcare providers is only going to help us in the long run because these are the people we're counting on to take care of all of us should we need them. Today's donation included more than 495 masks, 160 isolation gowns, and another 600 isolation masks. NEISD says it still has enough supplies for its own staff when school is back in session. Walmart announcing a new effort to protect all of its employees from COVID-19. That company will soon begin checking employees' temperatures and asking questions to assess their health. Any employee with a fever over 100 degrees is going to be sent home and asked to seek medical treatment. They'll not be allowed to return until they have been fever free for three consecutive days. The company also says to offer masks and gloves to workers who request them and screenings are expected to begin in the next three weeks or as soon as the Walmart folks receive their thermometer orders. The pandemic has shifted how some restaurants are staying afloat and helping the community. Right now on KSAT.com, we have a list of restaurants and eateries that are selling their supplies. Milk, eggs, beans, bread, even toilet paper. Some of these items have been hard to find at the grocery store. To find out which places are participating and to read up on a lot more about COVID-19 and the pandemic, just go to KSAT.com slash coronavirus. And what a Tuesday we've been enjoying. Bright sunshine, crisp baby blue sky, low humidity. Very comfortable out there. And overall, we know these, these types of days are numbered this time of year. And later this week, uh, you will be noticing the changes. Right now, 86 in Del Rio. 70, though, reported in Leon Springs. 75 in Bernie. 75 Halotus. So many locations still uh, in the mid-70s. At the airport in San Antonio, we actually topped out at 79 degrees. As we go through the evening, Clear sky, just some high thin clouds, low humidity and a calm wind by 10 p.m. will be down in the mid 60s. Enjoy a lovely evening outside. Rain chances really jump in the days ahead. I'll have an update on that coming up, Ursula. Thank you so much. Dust disinfectants, household cleaners, they might be hard to come by these days. And that is where DIY comes in. But that can be dangerous. The do's and don'ts of making cleaning supplies at home. That's next. From disinfecting wipes to bottles of bleach, cleaners have been in big demand as we do what we can to battle the coronavirus in our homes. But before you start using all kinds of different products at the same time, a warning, 1200 size Marilyn Moore, it says mixing certain combinations can be very dangerous. The nasty coronavirus has us reaching for these, sprays and wipes to clean and disinfect, especially high touch objects. What works? a lot. The EPA has a long list of effective products. If you don't have a disinfecting solution, the CDC says you can make your own. This is their recipe. For one quart of water, you use just four teaspoons of bleach. Just be very cautious. It's kind of a more of a wild west when you're um, mixing these different things at home based on some recipe you might have heard from someone else. Brian Sansoni with the American Cleaning Institute says bleach products should never be mixed with anything but water. Using incompatible household cleaners can be hazardous. With the bleach and ammonia example, that's where some of these uh, situations where there literally can be some, some toxic fumes, which um, can be very dangerous. 
This chart has been circulating on social media, warning bleach plus ammonia makes a toxic gas. Bleach plus rubbing alcohol equals chloroform, highly toxic. Even hydrogen peroxide plus vinegar creates a highly corrosive acid. You may not even realize what's in a product, so Sansoni says follow label directions. That includes leaving the product on long enough to destroy the virus. And that can range from anywhere between 30 seconds and several minutes. And remember, keep household cleaners out of the reach of children. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Today is the 25-year anniversary of Selena Quintanilla's death. Right now on KSAT.com, we take a look at her legacy, what makes her a cultural icon, and the most celebrated Mexican-American artist today. Just look for this story on the homepage of KSAT.com. And be sure to tune in to our one-hour primetime Siempre Salina special, which is airing Sunday, April 12th at 9 p.m. It's right here on KSAT 12. All right, we are just 24 hours from what was a gray, murky, ugly Monday. And now Tuesday is upon Tuesday's us. Tuesday is great, yeah. And we're just getting through this week. It's only getting better. Well, for a little while, right? <laughs> we have more changes to talk about as we get toward the end of the week. So definitely take advantage of what we have left this afternoon and evening, and then again tomorrow. And actually, that's my top headline. Take advantage of tomorrow, because we're not going to have as many opportunities to get outdoors with the kids and get them outside moving in the yard. Uh, because, well, the humidity returns, the clouds return, and with the clouds will be some rain. Not a bad thing. We could use the rain. I like what I see in terms of the rain chances. Of course, we'll dive into that in a moment. What a beautiful day. 78 degrees right now. Just some high thin clouds streaming overhead. A dew point of 47. So the relative humidity is at 33%. We've got that nice dry air because of our northeasterly wind at 13. Temperature wise near 80, just southwest of San Antonio. You get to Castroville 83 along with Divine Helotus 82. Meanwhile, 77 at Randolph. And 74 right now in Kerrville. You have to go down to Laredo to actually hit 90 degrees at this hour. Now, big difference today in terms of dew points. They've dropped off quite a bit because of the cold front that hit last night. So compared to this time yesterday, our dew points are anywhere from about 20 to 35 degrees lower. So there's the dew point of 47. Some dew points even in the 30s right now. Much drier, more comfortable air is in place. But it's harder to really make rain with this type of air in the springtime. Things will be changing though. We know the low hum the lack of humidity. Uh, those days, you know, the comfortable days are numbered. Now as we get into tomorrow, here's our future cast. We start the day low humidity. I don't really think you'll notice the humidity throughout the day, but it will gradually be rising by the afternoon and evening. These dew point numbers go upward and you notice it again by Thursday. Now, that's good because when we get the influx of moisture, we'll have a few other factors that come into play and it'll lead to some better rain chances. And we need the rain. Here's a look at our drought monitor, obviously from La Prior. Well, basically Uvalde, Southward, La Prior, Crystal City, Carrizo Springs. That's where we need some of the rain uh, the most across South Texas. But we could all use another good soaking rainfall. As for Medina Lake, I want to give you a quick update here. It's 73% full and it's now 12 feet below the conservation pool. So let's talk about our rain chances and our overall pattern. All we have this evening and tonight is just these high thin clouds coming in from the west. That's going to be the case tomorrow. Upper level ridge farther to the south over Mexico. And what we have here is the subtropical jet stream basically being funneled from the Pacific right over Texas. And this is going to be a big player in our overall long term weather pattern through the next seven days as it's going to transport some moisture and little bits of energy coming off the Pacific up above us. And that's going to help us along with a few other factors to generate some showers and thunderstorms. So let's get into the details here. 52 tomorrow morning, low humidity. What a great way to start the day tomorrow. 70 and sunny at noon, 79 for the high temperature, just some high thin clouds. Let's talk rain chances. Isolated showers and storms possible on Thursday. That's a 30% chance. By Friday, we boosted to 60%, so becoming much more likely and widespread. Maybe even some strong storms. Saturday, Sunday, 50 to 60% coverage across South Texas. And even as we get into early next week, some scattered activity. So that's looking good. Just what we need this time of year before we really crank up the heat. What was your advice, Adam? Weed and seed. Weed and seed. Weed and seed. That's right. I we did it one today. More day. You have one more day. <laughs> I actually, actually listened to Kasky. 
We didn't see Martin. it today, Greg. Yeah. Mark well done. Down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. DeMar DeRozan has been an advocate for people seeking mental health help. Yeah, remember back in 2018, he was one that came out and said he suffered from anxiety and depression. Now he's helping others kind of get through the COVID crisis with some help with some very special assists from a doctor, yeah, so in fact, a crazy. sports psychologist. When we come back, what he's doing is part of his share. And what's it going to cost to postpone the Olympics? You may be surprised. Coming up. First star, DeMar DeRozan, has taken upon himself to get through one of the most challenging times in our world history. The battle against the coronavirus and the isolation some are feeling as we work through the stay-home, work-safe orders from our government and health officials. Remember, it was DeRozan who helped launch the NBA Players Association Mental Health and Wellness Program for Players in 2018 when he revealed his struggles with anxiety and depression. It's hard to believe that the suspension of the NBA regular season is now in his third week with no immediate end in sight. And like most of us, feeling a little bit of shut in and shut down at times. In order to help, DeMar teamed up with Dr. Kenza Gunter, who's a well-recognized clinical sports psychologist out of Georgia and their conversation was carried on the NBA Instagram account. One of the big advantages we have during this crisis is access to social media through our phones to help us all stay connected with our friends. And one of the things Damar says that has helped him navigate through all this is jigsaw puzzles. I've been just trying to challenge myself every single day, try to do something new um, out the ordinary for myself. Um, I try to do a a big old puzzle the other day. Uh -huh. um, I haven't did since middle school. You know, yeah. steady working out every single night. Like you said, trying to get outside as much as possible. You know, I try not to look too far ahead so it don't drive me crazy. Focusing on the moment because that's all we really have. Things are changing so quickly. If we, if we focus too much on what life was before COVID-19 mm -hmm. or if we try to predict what's going to happen afterwards, like that can lead to more anxiety yeah. and yeah, more sure. fear, right? All right, today the Spurs are supposed to be wrapping up their last long road trip in Sacramento against the Kings before beginning the final month of the season. Counting tonight, there would have been nine games left in the regular season, eight in the month of April, with a final game scheduled for April the 15th against the Pelicans. Spurs are hoping that when the season does resume in May, they're hoping that would be given time for the Silver and Black to have a chance to catch Memphis for the eighth and final playoff spot in the Western Conference, but right now they're very optimistic. The 2020 Tokyo Olympics have officially been rescheduled for July 23rd to August the 8th, 2021, due to the outbreak of the coronavirus, but at what cost? When Tokyo won the bid in 2013, the estimated cost of the summer games is set at $7.3 billion. Japan has already spent $12.5 billion, and now it costs billions more to the setback. Estimates right now between 2 and $6 billion in Japanese taxpayers picking up most of that tab. Ouch. Yes. Thanks, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. All right, take advantage of outdoor activities tomorrow. Get some fresh air because look at those rain chances. They really jump up later on this week. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be raining every minute of every day, Thursday through the weekend, but looks like we'll have some more uh, shower activity and some thunderstorms, which is good. We could use it. Temps mostly in the 70s. Thanks for watching the News at 5 with us. See you back here at 6 o'clock.